Hello everybody, right, this video is mainly aimed at people who have had to um, isolate themselves due to positive tests etc etc um, but obviously any of you can use it for revision purposes so those of you that had to um, isolate the last thing that you probably remember doing in geography we were talking about migration and then we had a lesson where we introduced human trafficking by drawing some graphs so i gave you some tables of data and a piece of graph paper and you just had to decide how you were going to present that graphically and that was our little introduction to this topic so the next lesson that we had was all about uh, human trafficking it was not a very nice lesson because it's not a very nice topic um, and people had a choice so there are three pages of information, pages 24, 25 and 26 of the module are all about human trafficking. Some people chose to use those pages of the module booklet and do some annotating and some highlighting in the module. Other people chose to put their notes under our usual four headings which are on the screen as we speak. Uh, so obviously pause the video if you want to set your notes up. If you want to use the module booklet, that's fine. Okay. Um, for basic facts and figures then, unfortunately, it has a rather horrible claim to fame. Uh, human trafficking is the fastest growing crime in the world right now, um, which is horrifically true. Uh, and it's not very nice to hear about this, but I think it's really important that all of us are aware because one of the things that you'll discover is that it's likely that we see victims of human trafficking in our everyday lives. But until you can spot the signs, you can't do much to help. Okay, do not write down every fact or figure because we don't want data waffle. We don't want just loads and loads of facts and figures in our exam answers. Um, so just pick two or maybe three figures that you want to use. Um, as you can see, the only thing that graph really proves is that uh, the number of victims being detected is increasing. Could I please emphasise that the number of victims being detected uh, is going to be the tip of the iceberg. There's going to be many, many more that uh, we just don't know about. This one is quite an interesting way of mapping data. Um, they use the stick figures to show gender and age. So you've got adult males, adult females, and you've got uh, child females, child males. And then the colour coding is the, the main form uh, of trafficking in different regions of the world. It's not a very nice map to consider, but um, yeah, you can see there's definitely not a one size fits all version of trafficking. It does vary. And that takes that idea and does it in a slightly different way. So you can see that females are mostly trafficked for sexual exploitation, that's adults and children, whereas men are usually trafficked for slightly different purposes. Um, not something you want to dwell on, I know. Okay, um, so basic facts and figures. The other thing you need is a definition. I'll talk about what's on the screen in front of you in a minute, but the definition of human trafficking or people smuggling or modern day slavery, they're all different names for the same thing, um, is at the top of page 24. So you can highlight that or you could copy it into your notes. Human trafficking is the movement of people by means such as force, fraud, coercion or deception with the aim of exploiting them. So I just want to pick up on that. The movement could be international, might be internal. They don't have to leave the country, um, but there is often some element of movement. We did talk in class about that you can get versions of human trafficking where people actually stay in their hometown, um, but quite a lot of movement of people as well, international or internal. Force is physical violence or the threat of physical violence, and I'll show you some not very nice examples of this in a minute. Uh, fraud, coercion or deception is tricking people. And again, I'll show you some examples of that in a moment. And then exploiting them is, is making them do things they don't want to for your 
benefit. So it's a pretty hor horrible definition. So in your basic facts and figures, you need um, the definition, you need to know it's the fastest growing crime, and you might have two or three actual facts and figures. Okay, so how a boy from Vietnam became a slave on a UK cannabis farm. That is international, clearly, and it's forced labour. So he was being forced to work on a cannabis farm for free, treated like a slave from another country. You may have heard this news story. This was about 39 Vietnamese people who died in a lorry. Um, they uh, had been trafficked from Vietnam and um, they were probably, we assume, coming over for forced labour, possibly sexual exploitation, but probably forced labour. This is the, the trick bit. We know from international economic migration that people often want a better life in another country. And this is particularly true of people who live in less developed countries at the moment. They want to make their life better. And what the traffickers do is they exploit that. They, they trick them by saying, yeah, we can get you a plane ticket and you will get you a job in the UK. And then you obviously have to work for us for a little bit to pay off your, uh, the cost of your plane ticket. And then off you go. And that's where it usually goes wrong. And I've just got three uh, stories. These are from the BBC. I haven't made these up um, just to try and get across to you what we mean. So this is Kemi, who is a Nigerian, and she was promised a new life in Italy, as you can read for yourself, one that would allow her to provide for her family. So this is um, being tricked into human trafficking. She was tricked into work uh, sorry, into working in the sex industry and uh, she managed to run away uh, but then got deported to Nigeria. So I'm afraid not a particularly happy ending for that one. But that's being uh, tricked into something just because you actually wanted to make your life better. This one is also fraud but this is by her own family which is pretty terrible. Um, and this is domestic servitude. So this is having to work in somebody's house and essentially be their maid, do their cooking and cleaning and uh, childcare for them for free. Um, and she got stuck there for nine years without a day off and without being paid. So that's domestic servitude and that's sort of fraud. This one is a UK example. Um, this is probably the hardest to read, for which I apologise. Uh, obviously, that is not her real name, but a 13-year-old girl, vulnerable, um, was groomed by uh, a man and then passed around the UK. And uh, she was kept in that because of physical violence, because of force. So they were physically violent and threatened her family. So what I'm trying to get across is that human trafficking takes many different forms but if you keep coming back to that definition, um, it kind of encompasses all of the, the nastiness. Causes. These are written at the top of page 25. It's money, I'm afraid. Human trafficking is a way of making money by either using the victims to earn you money or not paying the victims a fair wage. And I've given um, some figures on page 25, just to give you an example of this. So in sexual exploitation, the victims earn you money, whereas in some other forms of human trafficking, you treat the victims like slaves and therefore you save money because you don't pay them fairly. There are also some bullet points on page 24 that tell you the main forms of uh, human trafficking. Number one, sexual exploitation, we've said, earns you money. Number two, domestic servitude saves you money because you don't have to pay someone properly to do that. Number three, forced labour will either earn you money or save you money. It could be either. Criminal exploitation will earn you money and other forms of exploitation usually earn you money all about economics I'm afraid that's the, the causes of human trafficking. The impacts uh, there are two one of which 
unfortunately in geography we sort of don't dwell on because it's not really our area of expertise but one of the main impacts is on the victims it's it's the trauma it's the the mental and physical effects of being treated like this and I've just used these photographs to try and sort of get across that to you that actually quite a few victims of trafficking have an ownership tattoo on them um, either a barcode or a name or property of and I'm just using those images to, to show you that people are turned into commodities things that can be bought and sold which is not ethically or morally okay at all um, so one of the impacts is on the victims themselves but like I say in our subject it's not really something we we dwell on and the second impact is uh, the expense of dealing with it it's very difficult and it's very expensive to tackle human trafficking more on that in a moment the uh, management responses we always try to find out okay there's this horrible problem what are we doing about it how are we managing this and on page 26 you'll find two paragraphs you need to know about the United Nations Blue Heart campaign which is um, an international campaign that is trying to do two things fundamentally number one it tries to give money to victims of human trafficking for medical bills, for solicitors fees, for somewhere to live, for counselling, for all sorts of things. So the Blue Heart campaign gives money to victims and it also aims to raise awareness so that they can train, for example, people who work on aeroplanes about stopping the sign, sorry, spotting, <laughs> spotting the signs of what somebody who's being trafficked might look like. How could you maybe alert the authorities that you're a little bit concerned about somebody? And the idea is that the more of us who know about human trafficking, the more of us can keep our eyes open and, and sort of begin to tackle this properly. And there's a couple of other links there. Um, I have sent this PowerPoint to all of you who are isolating. Um, so, yeah, if you haven't got it, just let me know. Um, the thing that we're doing in the UK is the Modern Slavery Act 2015. We have written an act of law and we are now uh, prosecuting people under it, including these two who uh, trafficked 18 people from Poland and uh, then kept, controlled their bank accounts. So they were earning money, but actually they never got their money and they were both sentenced to six years. So we are using the Modern Slavery Act 2015 and I've just included um, three news stories there of the Modern Slavery Act in action, including one um, where the... Um, victims were rescued in Columpton in Devon, ladies and gents. So it does happen in the southwest as well. Um, then, so that was a test um, that I have sent to you on a Word document. No, no, I'm lying, a PowerPoint, sorry. Um, and if you haven't had a go at that, I would have a go at that test without cheating because it will allow you to see whether things are ticking along okay, is geography making sense or not? Um, and again, if you've deleted that or you swear that you never received it, then let me know and I can send you that again. We finished that lesson with um, an hour long documentary called The Prosecutors, which is um, the first successful case um, tried under the Modern Slavery Act. Um, and I think it gets across all sorts of things to you. I think it gets across how difficult it is to um, prosecute people. I think it gets across how the victims of modern slavery have probably appeared in your everyday life without you necessarily noticing. Um, and I think it gets across how clever and cunning the, the criminals involved in it are. So I definitely, definitely would watch that please okay so that was uh, what we did for human trafficking I said I didn't particularly want people doing too much of their own research and um, work on this because there are some really very upsetting uh, things out there 
If you wanted to, uh, there is a brilliant Sky series. There's two series actually. What the first one's called Save Me, and the second one is called Save Me Too. Um, and it's not it's not nice, but it's not too graphic. It, it's not sort of too traumatizing. And it's about a, a girl whose silhouette you can see in the back of these images. A British schoolgirl called Jodie. Um, who becomes a victim of human trafficking and it's scary, it's fascinating um, and it's about as dark as I would want you to get with all this. Okay, so that's human trafficking, that was the, the first bit. The next lesson that um, we had, we did some exam technique stuff. So you could pause the video at this point if you wanted to and come back to it another time. That's absolutely fine with me. Um, but we're going to just talk about um, tackling exam questions. We had about half an hour or so where we just said, okay, let's think about how our knowledge of this module is actually going to be tested. Now, page 75 is where we started. But annoyingly, I can't put page 75 up on the screen for you because I don't have a scanned copy um, and it came from a textbook that I don't have with me at the moment. So I apologise, but you're just going to have to listen to me talking about page 75. I can show you the other pages, so there will be a visual. But turn to page 75 of your Global Governance modules, please. And we're going to look at the two questions. So um, there's figure one, which shows flows of migrant remittances in 2011. If you can, be disciplined, cover up the questions. Don't look at the questions, look at the map first. When you look at the questions first, it kind of puts blinkers on you and you don't pay maybe as much attention to the map. So cover up the questions, look at the map. You can pause the video at this point if you want, um, give yourself a couple minutes and then unpause and start again. Question A, analyse. That's your command word, analyse. Analyse is to look at something in detail. Analyse the pattern of remittances shown in figure one. Okay, well the trip hazard there is probably pattern. We don't want to get too bogged down in nitty gritty detail. We want to look at the big picture, the overall pattern that we are seeing on that uh, map. It's five marks. So in geography, five marks is just get on with it. We don't need a structure, we don't need an introduction, we just want to get on with it. And we want to try and find five different things we can say. Okay. I'm not going to give you all the answers, but you might say, for example, most of the remittances are coming from America. Most of the remittances end up in Asia. India receives more remittances than anybody else. That sort of thing. Okay. Now, the um, overall pattern is that the movement of money is generally from more developed countries or developed countries to less developed or developing countries um, because that's what you'd expect isn't it you'd expect people to move to a, a richer country earn money and send it home to their family so it's those kinds of points the part a questions are quite straightforward they're not meant to catch you out in any way you have to start using your brain in part b explain that's your command Explain one benefit and one risk of interdependency for different countries. Now for me, the trip hazard in that question is the number because it's really important that you only talk about one benefit and one risk. Explain one benefit and one risk of interdependency for different countries. Well, we've got a bit of head scratching to do first before we even start writing. What's interdependency? Right, that's relying on each other. How does figure one show interdependency? Well, one of the countries is getting the remittances, 
What does the other country get? Oh, they get people doing the jobs, they get people paying taxes. Okay, so then you've figured out what interdependency is and how it relates to this question, but we're still not answering the question. The question is, what's one benefit of that? So you need to pick out one benefit of people moving to another country to earn money and send it home. There's quite a few benefits there. You need to pick one of them and talk about it. What's one risk? How could that go wrong? Well, we know that all countries of the world have migration control. Every country is selective to a certain extent of who they let into their country. Let's say that wonderful Donald Trump decides he's not going to let anybody move into America. Well, look at the impact that that would have on India, China, Vietnam and the Philippines. That's a huge proportion of their income gone. So maybe one risk is immigration control, countries changing their policy and um, then suddenly one of your income streams is reduced. Five points roughly along those lines in the bag. Okay, page 77, ladies and gents. I can show you this one, you'll be pleased to know. Okay. Right, here it is. So this should be what you're looking at on page 77. I'm not going to go through this one in so much detail. Part A, you've got to compare the changes in the graph. Compare is similarities and differences. All right, so you've got to look at those six countries and you've got to find five things that you can say about similarities and differences. The trip hazard is include relevant data in your answer. You've got to use the axis to get some numbers. Okay. Part B, we've got to use our brain. All right, you're hopefully you're beginning to see a pattern here. Part B, we've got to think about that graph and we've got to think, how could that have affected international migration? And I'll give you a couple of clues here. Let's say you were a low skill manual worker. Which of these countries does it make sense for you to maybe move, be moving into? And which country would it make sense for you to be moving out of? Okay, so Italy has seen a huge reduction in low skill jobs, so you would probably leave Italy if you were a low skill worker, and it would make sense, it would make the most sense to move to the UK because that's in the biggest increase. It's that kind of thing, okay? And then do the same for the high skill. Which country would it make most sense to move to? Which country would it make least sense to move to, etc. etc. And if you had remembered, or if you knew, that the significant aspect about being in the EU is that there is freedom of movement between all member countries. That gets rid of your intervening obstacle of needing a visa. You don't need a visa for any of these countries because you're an EU citizen, so people can freely move between them. Okay, so that's that one. And then finally, we had a look at page 80 which I will just find for you. Okay, here we are. Again, part A, look at the graph, compare attitudes. Pick out countries that are quite kind about immigration, countries that are not very kind. Um, yeah, which countries have the most balanced feelings? Five different points about what that graph is telling you. The part A's, are generally quite straightforward. The part B, you've got to think about. Suggest means you don't know the answer. No one's ever taught you this. Just see if you can use your geographical brain and have a think about why, or how, sorry, suggest how attitudes such as those shown in figure three could affect government migration policies. And the clue I'm gonna give you here is who votes a government in? Who votes a government in? Think about what the people in these countries 
think or feel, think about governments and who votes them in and see what you think the government policy might be, for example, for Greece, for Germany, and so on and so forth. Okay, so it was just our first little look at exam questions. Um, just take some notes on that and we will revisit exam questions um, yeah, another another time after half term. Hope that's been helpful to you self-isolators. Uh, wish you all the best.